now um, I'd like to introduce my colleague Mia Ridge, um, Digital Curator for Western Heritage Collections at the British Library. Uh, and as part of the library's digital scholarship team, Mia delivers training and guidance on applying computational research methods to historical collections. Her current projects involve crowdsourcing the transcription of historical playbills that Nora mentioned earlier, and also experimenting with machine learning based methods with library collections. She's co-investigator of the Living with Machines project, which is going to be the subject of her presentation today. Uh, the project is a major data science digital humanities project with the British Library, um, uh, with the British Library and the Alan Turing Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. Over to Mia. Thanks, Mahendra. Um, so, as Mahendra said, it's a project about data science and history, but I think um, a deeper way of thinking about it is as a project that's not only applying relatively new or emerging methods to questions about the past, but it's also in the project exploring the future of collaboration between data science, history, and the digital humanities. Um, and I have to say this is a very personal perspective. The project has been under discussion for some time. Um, the, we're still compiling a team. Um, we're waiting for the official press release, so I'm trying not to give away too much. Um, and it also means that we don't have any snazzy graphics or anything to show you yet, except photos of people deep in conversation. <laughs> so the project began because the Turing and the British Library were looking for a way to really maximize the value of their sort of a co-location. Um, we'd been trying to convince the Turing and data scientists working there that you know, it's not only about modern data, modern medicine, um, insurance kinds of questions, but also that historical collections are rich sources for very kinds of inquiry. Um, not only historical inquiry, but social sciences and other kinds of inquiry as well. Um, so we see this project as a way of bringing together the strengths of each institution, the collections of the British Library, um, all the kinds of uh, work you've heard about today in terms of digital scholarship, the work that we're doing to encourage greater, more inventive, creative uses of our collections, um, but also bringing together the expertise in data science. Going back to Daniel's keynote, it's really hard to recruit technical people. So um, the more that we can work with Turing, the further we can go together. Um, we've got a number of people who've been working on the project. Um, it's a mixture of uh, computational linguists, geographers, traditional historians with expertise in the Industrial Revolution, digital humanists, digital historians, data scientists, people with a background in English literature. Um, it's a really varied group. We've got research software engineers as well um, coming together to try and tackle these very large problems. So the project itself, um, we have to acknowledge, obviously, there's a wide body of scholarship on the Industrial Revolution, but we're saying, what can you learn by applying emerging methods like data science, artificial intelligence, to collections at scale? How does that working at scale, working with massive digitised collections, working with new methods, how does it change some of the questions and some of the answers that we have about the impact of the Industrial Revolution on the lived experience of people who went through it? Um, so we're focusing on the long 19th century, which is one of those beautifully sort of English historical ways of saying a couple of decades either side of the 19th century. Um, we're looking at how technology all, uh, altered the fabric of human existence. Hopefully the resonance with modern life is clear that um, we're all living through another revolution in terms of the impact of artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, computational annual analytics, um, the scandals about influence and um, data mining at Facebook and other companies. We're living through a moment of great uncertainty. We don't know how this will play out. So in some ways, looking to the past is a way of thinking about where we are now and how we as a society will deal with those issues that emerge. So overall, we are aiming to find new historical findings. It's really important to us that the um, historical findings can be published in traditional historic history journals. So it's not all, we applied this cool new method and historians don't want to know anything about it. We're actually trying to change how historians feel about the practices and historiography um, to, by making it more accessible to ordinary historians. Um, we're also looking at how can we provide access to digitized collections. We've heard about some extraordinary people today who found ways to make those collections accessible. They've found ways to use them in their scholarship. They've come up with creative uses. But not everyone has those skills or the time it takes to learn them um, or the support they need to really get stuck into those things. So we want to make it more accessible. 
We're also looking to develop and publish and share computational models, tools, code. We're running tutorials. We'll be doing lots of documentation, lots of outreach that will help people apply it to other research projects. We're also very aware that there's a lot of expertise in um, newspaper scholarship, in um, the history of the Industrial Revolution, in applying computational methods. So we're talking to other projects um, and running things like uh, workshops where we ask them to share what they would um, have done differently in hindsight based on their projects. And we're also working towards a quite radical collaboration. I think in the library we forget how radical some of the collaboration that we do is. We, collaboration is kind of in our blood, it's what we do. We collaborate across departments, we collaborate with scholars, with students, with institutions, with people who want to use our digitised content. <coughs> People in traditional his, uh, academic departments haven't necessarily worked that way. They might sort of sit in their stream of data science, statistics, computational linguistics or history. So we're um, sort of pushing at the boundaries of those things. The idea is that we work iteratively through um, the processes. So the infrastructure is responsive to the questions and the questions in some ways are responsive to the infrastructure and the methods and the tools and they all sort of um, feed into one another um, and I think one of the tricks for us is going to be maintaining a kind of long view of where we want to be while also dealing with um, everyone's individual interests um, and the kinds of complications that you come up against when you're working with infrastructure. So we've put some practices in place already and I thought it might be interesting to just share some of them. We've written a project charter, so we're working through at the moment what that means in terms of um, crediting everyone. If we do a conference proposal, do we list all 15 team members? What does that look like in reality? Um, sharing a project bibliography, so using a tool like Zotero to share key readings from our field so we can each understand each other's perspectives. Um, we're using sort of agile methods and scrum within the project. We're running fortnightly sprints at the moment, which is really challenging for some of the very senior people who aren't used to having to explain to anyone what they're doing. Um, it's also challenging for people who haven't worked in that way before. Um, and we're kind of working out the best way to make that work in reality. So there's always, you need some time for project updates as well as reporting on things. Um, everyone's learned how to use GitHub, so great, they can go and get a job with Dan <laughs> in Cambridge. Um, we're physically locating people together. We're also looking at shared training and other kinds of experiences um, to help the team really bond across their disciplinary dif differences. And the final thing that we're doing is forming labs. Um, which might be something like a work package. We've got milestones as well. Um, but these labs are ways of us thinking through um, how do we deliver a project this large? It's five years in scale. Um, it's a large team. So if sources is not only looking at the work of getting sources ready. If you've worked with historical text, you'll know it needs a lot of cleaning. Either the, the transcription data is dirty or um, it sort of needs to be named entity recognition and sort of uh, working out exactly what you have in that data set, but we're also looking at ways of explaining what the biases are. So our collections are the result of hundreds of years of decision making, so which newspapers ended up being collected um, from a shared reading room um, and saved and into the collection, what decisions were made about deaccessioning duplicates, um, what decisions were made about digitisation, how uh, some newspapers are more findable than others, some have been used quite heavily in scholarship already, so we're trying to explain the biases um, if you see a visualisation, you should also have a sense of what's not shown in that visualisation, what didn't fit in, what was too complex, too messy. Um, in the Languages Lab, we're looking at applying computational linguistics methods, network analysis um, to sources including newspapers and novels and poetry um, and other sources to understand the lived experience. Um, space and time is the kind of cool one that everyone wants to get involved in. Um, it's looking at census data, other event-based records, um, to understand urban change. So there's a lot of movement through the Industrial Revolution, but how much of it was local, how much of it was um, between cities, etc. How much did the cities expand over that time? Um, and using spatial and temporal analysis methods to understand that. Communities is the one that I'm most heavily involved in. So it's not about communities at the time. It's about two different communities. One, academic communities in different disciplines. So how do we intervene in data science? How do we intervene in history? How do we get people to encourage their undergraduates to use our methods um, or include them in their courses in some way? It's also about finding meaningful ways for the public to engage with the projects. We know there's masses of expertise amongst Wikipedians, amongst family historians, community historians, um, 
people sort of making uh, little websites and scripts for their own work. And you've seen in some of the nominations, family historians really engaging with things like newspaper collections. So how can we bring them into the project while working around um, academic concerns, copyright, data protection, etc.? And then the final lab is about bringing that all together and ensuring that the um, outputs work across the whole project and work outside the project. And the infrastructure one sort of underpins that and um, helps ensure that there'll be a legacy for this project after the end of the funding period so that um, it goes beyond. Um, and I'll just close with saying um, what's exciting for me about the project. Um, unlike sort of some big academic projects or things like exhibitions where you're sort of quite used to the outcomes that you'll be producing, this is very consciously experimental. We have goals, we don't know exactly how we're going to deliver them. Um, we're being very self-reflexive as we go, thinking about how it's changing us as well as how it might change the fields of scholarship. Um, it's huge. I think working in the library, we get quite used to the idea that we're working with hundreds of millions of records, but for many other people, that's new to them. Um, and the complexity is really huge in terms of the numbers of sources, the questions we want to ask of them, how we move things between one set of questions into another. Um, and finally, it's really radically collaborative. So everyone is facing some sort of challenge or change to usual practices and disciplinary norms. I certainly spent a lot of time explaining library business, library timelines, <laughs> library concerns, our relationships with other partners, that kind of tacit knowledge that we take for granted um, so that the other partners in the project understand how and why we're responding to different things and how we're contributing. So I'll close there and say if you have any questions, find me in the break because I think we're out of time. Yep. Thank you.